Welcome to the Humans Invent Cycling Podcast, which is coming to you from Paris Nice, the race to the sun. My name is Lionel Burney and I'm joined by Ciro Scondomilio, the cycling correspondent for the Italian sports paper Gazzetta dello Sport. I'm certain your array of fans are delighted you're back, Ciro. Are you happy to be here? Yes, I'm really happy to be here. We are here in the race towards the sun. We are in the sun now. And Lionel, we are working hard every day. Our friends, our colleague... Uh, Dan Friebe and Richard Moore, they were part of the podcast, important part of the podcast last year, but I don't know now where they are, maybe in holidays, I don't know, I don't see them. Terrible accusation that they might be on holiday, Chiro, I'm not sure what they'll make of that. Et le nouveau maillot jaune, accueilli par Bernardino, le britannique Geraint Thomas, double champion olympique. That's Daniel Monjas announcing Geraint Thomas in the yellow jersey. Okay, so we're in Belleville, which basically translates as beautiful town. Um, Not seen much of the town yet, um, but we're sat outside the Hotel de Ville, as Chiro said, in the sunshine. Stage four has finished not long ago, and Tom Yelta Slagter, Slagter means butcher in English, uh, won the fourth stage for Garmin Sharp and Sky's Garant Thomas has taken the yellow jersey. And this is what Garant had to say in the press conference afterwards. Garant, um, you said yesterday that today would be the first important stage of the race, but your move, was that predetermined to go then, or were you reacting to the move from Slackter? To be honest, I uh, didn't really think. It was kind of like racing as a junior again and just going. And once I went, I was like, what the hell am I doing? This is... uh, you know, as I remember saying this morning, it's 14k, it's a long way to go and it's quite a lot of flat. But once you're committed and committed and, you know, we worked well together and I knew they'd probably start messing around behind, especially if there wasn't many in the same team. And, um, yeah, that played into our hands really well. And, um, it was just unfortunate that the, the last K, uh, obviously Stagda was, was wanted to win the stage, as I did, but... Um, you know, he, he sort of called my bluff a bit and I could see the, the group coming and I didn't want to just mess about and, you know, waste all that energy for nothing. So I kept riding and I knew he was going to jump me um, and he did and I didn't quite get onto his wheel. I was sort of like that bike left behind all the way in. Yeah, to, to take the jersey is uh, incredible really. I never really, really thought that would happen and um, yeah, it's just a, a privilege, you know, and Paranese is one of the biggest stage races on the calendar, you know, behind the Grand Tours, and uh, it's just unbelievable, really. I didn't really dream of uh, being in this position, especially a week ago. Um, you know, it was only Friday when I was told I'd be the yeah, Alan leader for this race. Uh, we're obviously, with Richie moving to Tirreno, so it's a very uh, special day for me, really, personally. So, ten years ago, in 2004, Geraint Thomas and Ian Stannard finished first and second in the Junior Paris-Roubaix, which was held on the same day as the pro race and finished in the velodrome in Roubaix, maybe two or three hours before the pro race arrived. And actually, as they approached the velodrome, they were both away with a chase group pursuing them. Um, Stannard took a wrong turning slightly, leaving Thomas free to basically go into the velodrome and take the victory. Stannard recovered to take second place. But it's just interesting that 10 years on, that generation of riders who perhaps have grown up a little bit in the shadow of all of Mark Cavendish's success and obviously Bradley Wiggins winning the Tour. It's interesting that they've had such a a good fortnight, really, with Stannard winning Het Newsblad and now Geraint Thomas leading Paris-Nice. The Humans Invent Cycling Podcast. Interviews and analysis. We've got the big talking points covered. Four stages down four to go. It's fair to say the first three stages were fairly run-of-the-mill sprints, although there were a couple of stories to come out of them. Nasser Bouhani won the opening stage and uh, this year, unlike last year when he also won the opening stage, this year he managed to defend his yellow jersey, whereas last year he crashed while wearing it. The second stage was probably more notable for Janny Meersman's prolonged pursuit of the quick step, the Amiga Pharma quick step team car um, after he crashed near the finish of the stage. 
and uh, he was trying to get back up to contest the sprint which was won by Moreno Hoffland of the Belkin team and then yesterday's stage stage three was won by John De- Degenkolb on the motor racing circuit at Magny Cour and that was not necessarily a new experience for Degenkolb because he won a stage of the 2012 Vuelta on the motor racing circuit in Aragon in Spain really today's a the stage where the race has come alive and Geraint Thomas has perhaps answered Christian Prudhomme's criticism um, of the Sky team because the story on the eve of the race was that uh, Richie Port, the defending champion who was due to start Paris-Nice pulled out to replace Chris Froome who's suffering with a bit of a back injury. Froome pulled out of Tirreno Adriatico, Port moved over to ride in Italy and that elevated Geraint Thomas to team leadership and Prudhomme wasn't terribly happy about that. But I spoke to Dave Browsford on the second morning of the race just for his reaction and this is what Dave had to say about Sky reshuffling the pack. It was a bit late in the day, I think I think that's fair to say. However, when you, when you look at it, I think these two races, you know, simultaneously, two World Tour races and you want to try and get as many World Tour points as possible. I think within the, within the sport and, you know, for teams, World Tour ranking points are, are ever so important. Um, more so than maybe the outside world might perceive. I'm not sure how many people look at the World Tour sort of league table and go, oh, well, that's, that's important to see as a, as a relevant kind of um, measurement. But I think certainly within the team, we consider it to be, to be very, very important. And the situation was very simple, really. You know, um, at the start of the week, uh, Chris aggravated um, a back problem. It's not a, not a big deal, really, but um, enough to make us think, you know, if, if it's one of those things that if you don't let it settle down and, and get, a, get on top of it, get rid of it, then, then it could persist. You know, it's one of those sort of niggly things where you think, actually, we just need some rest. Um, and not totally off the bike, but just, uh, just some rest. So we thought, actually, the, 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 the best, the conservative thing to do would be to take them out of terrain for the time being, bring them back into Catalonia, of course, with an eye, you know, more on, 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 the, on the big summer events. Um, so that kind of left us in a bit of a predicament, really, because we entered Richie into Paris-Nice, known full well that he's a defending champion, he should come here. Um, and then when Paris-Nice is, uh, they, when they announce the race, because we don't know the race when we have to select our teams, which is a bit of a difficulty in this sport. So you kind of, then, then the race says, well, here's the race that we're going to put on this year. And then you realise there's no hilltop finish, there's no time trial, the course has been changed dramatically, which is entirely the you know the the right of the organizer and and it's one of the joys of this sport is that you never quite know what the race is going to be like every year but what was quite clear was that it was it wasn't a race that suited Richie Port's particular talents and so we decided actually we would leave him in the race even though we thought he couldn't win it Um, or the chances of you know being competitive are much less than a traditional Paris but of course when Froomey got pulled out of Terreno and we know that Terreno suits Richie much more and we also know that given that you know, Richie's going to ride the Giro to ride in in Italy at Torino would make a lot of sense. Um, we then sat down and thought, actually, Geraint we know is going really, really well, and in fact, we were thinking that Geraint was going to be the leader here anyway. So really, we got Richie in a race over here, which he was coming to be a participant in, really to support. Whereas if we sw- sw- swapped him over, he could go into a race where we'd lost our leader, as it were, and he potentially could lead the team. Uh, in a race which suits his ability so from a performance point of view it was a no-brainer for us um, but of course from a, from an organizer's point of view I think um, you know it's a bit frustrating for them on you know late in the day that the, uh, the the reigning champion gets pulled out so you can kind of understand Christian Prudhomme's comments he he went public with his um, disappointment um, that that uh, Richie wasn't going to be here to defend his title but I guess you can see his point as well no, I can see his point totally, but I think the organisers, you know, organise races and they choose a race, uh, the terrain and the style of race that it's going to be, and we pick the teams. Is it a source of frustration as well? That, that I mean, it's it's historic, it's not a new thing, but Paris-Nice and Tirreno, two World Tour races overlap with one another. You can't be in two places at once. I gather you're going to do a few days here, see how it pans out, and then possibly go into Tirreno for um, the second half of that. It, it does feel like uh, something needs to be sorted out and shifted with the calendar because um, teams, although a lot of the teams have got much bigger resources than in previous years, everything's spread across events and, and the focus of um, the, the watching public is split between two races for half a week at least. 
I agree. I totally agree, actually. Um, and I think you can't, you know, you, you can if you if you imagine the the, the, the top twenty or thirty percent of the riders in the world, you know, they're all going to get split. They have to make a choice. Am I going to do terrain? I'm going to do Paris-Nice. And um, because the course comes out relatively late, you tend to find that previously the, the classics guys would tend to traditionally would, they would tend to favour uh, Terreno Adriatico and go from there into Milan San Remo and then go on to the classics. And the GC guys would come over to Paris Nice, but that's been thrown its head, for example, this year. Um, and I think it is a shame because I think that in an ideal world, the calendar would allow um, the teams to focus on, on one World Tour race at a time. And we could plan appropriately, we could put the best riders in, they could prepare to the best possible level to make it a great race. And then, you know, a week or so later, you'd have another great race, which would be Paris. So we're getting a, a double hit rather than diluting it as it is at the minute, you know. And I think from a TV audience point of view, from a commercial point of view, and in terms of the growing numbers of people who are coming into the sport and thinking, oh, I quite, quite, quite like cycling, I'm new to cycling, let me try and figure out the cycling calendar and how this sport works. It's, just, it's so confusing. You're trying to, I, I constantly trying to sit down and explain how the cycling calendar works and you know it, it's not easy to be to be honest so I think if we had a, a set number of world tour races all appropriately spaced out which attracted the best riders to those races they were televised there was an, a, a season long kind of competition that grew so you could see what the rankings were you could see what the team rankings were the individual rankings were the best sprinter the best climber the best time trialist etc then you have something to progressively follow there's a narrative through the season which people can get excited about and it's it's not complicated and I think I think it'll happen to be honest so that'd be good well we'll hear a little bit more from Brailsford later in the show but Chiro this is your first time in Paris-Nice normally you would be at Tirreno Adriatico a big important race for um, the Italian cyclists but you're here instead why is that yes mainly for the presence of Vincenzo Nibali is here and you know that now he's the most important Italian rider and for sure this year he will uh, target the Tour de France and so for that he has decided to do a different program and so uh, my chief has been clear at the beginning of the year where is Vincenzo Gazzetta dello Sport has to be and so so that's why well, you are the voice of Vincenzo Nibali, really, because you write the column, uh, ghost write the column for him in the newspaper. Do you still do that? No, not for the moment. I mean, we did uh, sometimes in last Tour de France, but as a matter of fact, in the last period, in last months, I mean, I did also races in February in Dubai and in Oman, for example. Vincenzo was there. And as a matter of fact, in the last months, I'm seeing Vincenzo more than my friends or my parents and so it's a little bit then something that maybe it's it's a worry for me but it's like that for the moment is he not fed up with you yet you're always just around the corner stalking him yes yes exactly and for that i'm trying to be careful because the season is so long we should arrive to the tour de france and so so later so it's better to be careful i mean at the i mean i'm really always with, with him but with description now, Nibali being here, um, it's a little bit unusual because the parkour of the race does not suit him at all. There's no time trial, there's no significant uphill finish, although we didn't see too much of him today on the, the climb that was about 14 or 15 kilometres from the end. What do you think is the reason for him being here? Um, in my opinion, it's also um, the main question uh, is uh, a question of uh, relationships between his team and the ASO organization. You know, Paris is organized by ASO, the same organizer of the Tour de France. And uh, for them, uh, it is important to be here with Vincenzo, I mean, in this race, because uh, as a matter of fact, as you said before, the majority of champions is in Tirreno Adriatico. So, I mean, in my opinion, it's a politic uh, question and also the fact that Vincenzo he will do the Tour de France to try to win the yellow jersey and he wanted to do uh, something different uh, comparing with the last years he will do also for example normally at this moment a race as Tour of Romandy that he never did more or less in the past so uh, a changement in uh, function of the Tour de France but the main reason in my opinion it's a political question the will of Astana and Bosnia Alexander Vinoglu to stay in good relation with the 
Peter Eso. Yeah, because Nibali, he traditionally has done Tirreno Adriatico, and obviously when he was targeting the Giro, that makes perfect sense. But this year, I gather he will do Paris Nice, um, the Dauphiné in June, For um, sure. and and then in, into the Tour de France. So I guess he's sort of re- refamiliarizing himself with uh, with France and with the ASO organization. But in terms of the race itself is there anything of value for him here because is it going to be hard enough to give him the racing condition to go forward in the season is there enough of an opportunity to test himself Uh, in my opinion yes and I explain why Uh, in the last few years he was able to win Tirreno Adriatico on a very tough parkour but this year at this point of the year he has no the same condition so maybe uh, because he spent the winter I mean uh, with a lot of things to do because he's the winner of the Giro d'Italia his wife is pregnant uh, I mean only two weeks ago he became a father and so he hasn't the same condition and so in my opinion Tirreno Adriatico at this period of the year would have been so too much tough for him and so maybe here with the different parkour maybe he can improve better than in Tirreno yeah and I assume with uh, the Pompiana climb not being in Milan Sanremo and Lamani not being in uh, that race is not the same objective for Nibali as perhaps in the past not not at all and as a matter of fact um, in my opinion now his participation is not 100% sure. Uh, I think that the team has the intention to make a point after the Paris and then they will decide. For sure, I don't want to say that he won't be in Milan Sanremo. Uh, maybe he could participate for the moment, it's not sure. But with this parkour, certainly he arrived the third in 2012, there were Le Manie. Now this year without Mania, I don't think, uh, uh, I mean, it can be a factor in Milan Sanremo, not at all. Now, you say you're stalking Nibali, but I'm starting to wonder whether you're stalking me because we saw you in the creperie restaurant in Rambouillet a few nights ago. Last night, we bumped into you in the back streets of Nevers. You, you claimed you were trying to find somewhere to watch the Milan Champions League game. But how are you finding Paris-Nice so far? Uh, I mean, uh, as you know, dear Lionel, uh, I'm here in Paris-Nice to work. <laughs> But my head, my brain works every day, 24 hours a day, also for other stuff. And for example, uh, restaurants, uh, I mean, football matches in the evening, because I learned from a lot of big riders, then in stage races, and for sure, nobody can doubt that Paris is a stage race, certainly eight stages and not 21 as a Grand Tour, but a stage race. So in the stage races, the more important thing is to recover, to recover from our work all day long. And so for that, these things, restaurants, football matches, little walks are really important. They are indeed. They are indeed. What did you make of the crepe in the creperie restaurant a couple of nights ago? It's not the kind of thing that you would eat in Italy, is it? Exactly. Uh, I have to confess that uh, not an excellent level, Lionel. I, uh, I mean, I'm also really fond of crepes and uh, I know that and also our listener maybe already know, but I can also tell them that uh, the best part of France for crepe is Bretagne. So now, unfortunately, we are far from Bretagne and so crepes are not so good. But, I mean, our hope, my hope, then in a few days we arrive near the beach in Nice. This is the main target of this race. Not Nibali, with, with all my respect, also all my, my respects to Garen Thomas, TJ Slagder, all of them. But the sea and beaches are really more important. Well, we've got three days down at the beach, uh, so it's going to be a nice weekend for you, Chiro. Um, but you're not the only person making his Paris Nice debut this year. Earlier in the week, I spoke to the young British rider Simon Yates. Now, Simon, you may remember, won the Dartmoor stage of the Tour of Britain last summer, and he's turned pro for Orica Greenedge. And I wanted to find out how he found his first day in the World Tour. Simon Yates, the first stage of Paris Nice was your first race at World Tour level. So, how did you find it? Um, stressful. Uh, I think that's the one thing uh, I noticed even like the races up before and uh, just with sort of uh, the professionals. Just uh, there's a lot more pressure and a lot more focus of everyone being at the front and being in position. And uh, yeah, even more so here. Um, I think we're lucky that 
this year it's such good weather. You know, I've, I've only heard uh, it's real bad weather here normally, so uh, yeah, quite lucky in that respect. Which of the pro races have you done before, and and how much of a step up in level was it in terms of the speed, in terms of the nervousness, that kind of thing? Well, like I say, it's just a, just a nervous, nervousness really. Obviously, the levels a lot higher. You know, everyone turns up with the with the best guys and the and the better teams, and uh, you know, it's not really. Uh, Maybe, except for maybe the real top guys, you know, it's not not a preparation race anymore. You know, we're sort of into the season, and uh, so yeah, I think it is a, a bit of a step up, but uh, it's not as big as I thought it would be. I don't know how hard it was yesterday, and you know, it wasn't it wasn't an easy stage by any stretch. But uh, yeah, we'll see how the rest of the race goes, and then now. Uh, you um, got a point in the King of the Mountains, or a couple of points in the King of the Mountains. Was that something that you looked at the road book and perhaps targeted in the morning, or was it an opportunity that presented itself on the road? Or you know, what motivated you to go for that? Oh no, I didn't. I didn't really go for it. Uh, I just ran on the front uh, with a couple of the other guys, and it just happened to be my turn on the front when we hit the climb. So, yeah. <laughs> but it does give you, you know, you've got a, you, you're off the mark in that competition. Does that change anything today with a, with any climbs on the course? Uh, is it something that you'll look at? No, no, I don't think so. I think uh, today is just all for the sprint, and uh, we were a bit, bit unlucky yesterday with the crash, and uh, so yeah, hopefully we can uh, change that around and uh, have a good go today. You're listening to the Humans Invent Cycling Podcast, powered by Sharp. So let's just recap a little bit of the race, Chiro. Nasser Buhani, he's always good at this kind of race, not quite the level of Kittel or Cavendish as a sprinter, but it was good to see him win and also to defend the yellow jersey for one day. Exactly. Uh, I know a little bit of his story, and maybe also the majority of listeners already know his story, I don't know, but uh, you know that uh, in the winter period he trains as a boxer, yeah, exactly. And uh, his meet uh, is his legend is Mike Tyson, and he's uh, now is reading the biography about the life of uh, uh, Mike Tyson. So I mean, it's an interesting guy. This uh, Nasser Bouani. Uh, someone in the group told me that some years ago. I mean, he is still young, but some years ago it was maybe twenty or. 19, he had also a little quarrel with Alessandro Petacchi after a stage of uh, the Tour of Turkey. Um, the meaning is that, uh, well, this Nasser Bouani has no fear of anybody. And for, for that, he's an, an interesting guy for the sprint. For me, he's not still ready to win a big classic as Milan Saremo for the moment. Maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, uh, but he's really interesting. He certainly is. He strikes me as quite a pugnacious character. Quite, He's got quite an aggressive streak. And let's hope that uh, we don't see him trying to take a, a bite out of somebody's ear like Mike Tyson did with Evander Holyfield all those years ago. Yes, exa- exactly, exactly. Good, uh, good well, done. well, say as you can say in English, Leo. That is yeah. true. I mean, in cycling, we are used to the most strange things. So who knows? For the moment, no ears eaten, but who knows in the future? I mean, I don't think you're encouraging that, though, are you, Chiro? No, but, not, not at all. Not at all. Okay, so the the second stage was uh, probably, as I said before. Um, more notable for Gianni Meersman sitting on the back of the Omega Pharma quick step car for so long in the final. Um, he, this is not something that's unusual in cycling. We do see it all of the time, but perhaps because uh, he was in the green jersey and perhaps because he was a contender to win the stage, the commissaires came down quite heavily on him. Um, I spoke to the Omega Pharma quick step sports director, Wilfred Peters, and as you can probably hear, uh, he wasn't really up for discussing the controversy. Wilfred, yesterday Gianni Meersman crashed at a very crucial point in the race um, and obviously there was a slight controversy because he was very close to the bumper of the team car trying to get back. I suppose the first question is, where were his teammates? Were there no, was it not possible to get the message to them to come back and help Gianni? On that moment was not a possible one. That was outside the car. The riders did not see that and that was uh, a, a big uh, discussion about... Uh, left and right and then I was too busy with my going back in the bunch obviously the priority for the rider is to get back into the bunch and it's not uncommon for all um, riders to sit on the bumper for quite a long time in, in races do you think the issue was that it was so close to the end of the race and that he was in the green jersey and it makes him more uh, visible to the commissaire I think it's a normal situation I think uh, the, the commissaire must need to make some things like that I, my, my job is going back in the, in the convoy with the cars and 
was the, the road was blocked for that there was no cars and then the, all the other cars need to pass me and then it was, was too difficult in all the cities left and right and then there was there was close with the car I said, okay when they come to the bunch he, he did by he did did it by himself Obviously, Gianni is injured and has gone home from the race, and he's at hospital um, this morning, we gather. Um, but in terms of the penalty that he was given by the organisers, were you expecting that? Do you think that is the right uh, response from the commissaires? OK, this is, this is the rules. I can't say nothing about that. But we know it's common in bike racing that this, this happens. Do you think there's a better solution? Because when you have a crash, there is no real alternative for the rider. Is that how you see it? Does, uh, so every time like that, normal, the rule is... Everybody need to close the convoy. And okay, there was not car. And everybody closed the convoy. And sometimes, okay, this was in the final, that was a different. But every, every, after every, every crash is some, some car, uh, guys after the car. So no, nobody come back. In terms of the rest of the race, what is your objective here now? Um, do, you, do you feel you have a card to play in the overall? Or will you look for a stage win? Uh, first we look for a stage win. And then uh, hopefully we can make some things with Jan Bagerland and Stibar for the classification. Cycling podcast with humansinvent.com. Innovation, craftsmanship and design. So that was Wilfred Peters there, pretty much playing a, a straight bat, as we say in England, Chiro. He didn't really engage with the, the problem. He said it's normal that a rider will, will sit on the bumper of a car like that. But obviously it does, as the organisation and the commissaires say, it does give cycling a bad image when people are tuning in to watch the race and they see the, the leader in the points competition six inches uh, 30 centimeters from the bumper of the car yes exactly but I mean in this case I mean uh, we know that uh, this kind of thing happen uh, sometimes in the final but in this case TV show everything so in my opinion no doubt about uh, the decision of the, the commissioners uh, the I mean the sad fact uh, it was that Johnny Merchant had physical problems so he has to to lift the race I mean it was a good shape and it was a pity for him yeah Indeed, it was. Yeah, so he went back to Belgium to uh, to be treated for his injuries um, from that crash. Are you a motor racing fan at all? You're interested in Formula One. Did the did the finish at Magnicourt uh, yesterday? Did that did that strike any uh, particular interest in you? I thought it looked quite good. It, the crowd was not maybe as big as we'd had hoped for, but uh, it was interesting to watch the the peloton use the big wide roads and the sweeping corners um, and really make the most of the road. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, I'm fan of Formula One also motor, and uh, I mean, the final yesterday was fascinating, yes. And the, the strange fact, I mean, the coincidence was that one uh, German guy, as John Degenkolb, German as Sebastian Vettel, that now is the greatest champion in Formula One with four world titles in a row, and German as Michael Schumacher, maybe uh, uh, without any doubt the most uh, winner in Formula One with seven words and 91 GP. We know, we always uh, we already we know that Michael Schumacher has some great important physical problems now he's still in the hospital in Grenoble and uh, John Dagenkolb after the stage uh, also gave uh, some words important words for Schumacher and the coincidence moreover is that Manicur was the circuit in which Michael Schumacher won more in all his career eight times so incredible coincidence indeed yeah I I gather from the organisers of ASO the reason the race finished there was because the city of Nevers preferred for it to be there and the, the, the organisers were more than happy because the infrastructure is all there. They have all of the press, the setup for the press, plenty of room for the team buses. I, I wonder you, whether you think the Grand Tours could do finishes like this. I remember in the 1989 Tour they finished on the circuit in Belgium at spa franco Um Raul Alcala won, the Mexican rider won the stage that day. And I remember being struck when you watch the Formula One races, you don't get the impression of the steep downhills and uphills, and, uh, whereas when somebody's riding on a bike, the circuit takes on a whole different characteristic. Do you think it's something that uh, maybe the, we could maybe see the Giro at Imola? Uh, why not? I remember that, for example, the, some years ago in the Giro, Petacchi won a stage in Mugello for motor, and also in Imola some years ago, Pozzato the, became Italian champion. Uh, also, for example, I remember that Welta started from Assen, 
and uh, the Tour de France, the grand part of 2009, was in Monte Carlo, in the streets of the G- mythic uh, GP, so why not? So, John Degenkolb then, he won the sprint yesterday. People are talking about him as a potential winner for Milan Sanremo. Are you surprised that at the moment uh, Giant Shimano are not going to take Marcel Kittel to the Primavera? No, I'm not surprised. I spoke uh, about this uh, just yesterday with Lionel Marie, one of the sportive director of Giant Shimano, and then he explained to me then uh, it has been a technical choice. On Cipressa and Poggio is convinced that Kittel, when... Um, I mean, men as Cancellara and also Garen Thomas, why not? Shamanero, the others that they, mo- they can move on Cipressa and Poggio for Kita can be too hard. For John Dengel, not. Also, for example, today we had another example because we was able more or less to arrive with the main group. So why not? In my opinion, yes, uh, we can't remember. We, we have to remember that some, uh, in 2012 he arrived uh, fourth at the wars in uh, Wackenburg and it was the car work to pass a lot of times. So why not? Well, I caught up with Geraint Thomas yesterday after the finish in Magnicourt just to ask him what he made of the uh, finish on the motor racing circuit and this is what his impressions were. Okay, Geraint Thomas is just warming down after coming onto the Magnicourt circuit. How did you find it coming onto the motor racing circuit there? It was really racing from like 30, 40k out. Yeah, the boys rode really well for me and I didn't really have to do anything until we got maybe 5k to go and then I just had to sort of float around and try and stay out of trouble and... uh, I thought it'd be okay on that motor racing circuit, but uh, it was anything but. It was uh, hectic, bodies everywhere, and people nearly crashing. And but uh, yeah, fortunately, he just stayed close to the front out of trouble. And uh, yeah, another day down. Why was that? Was that because it was windy out there, or because the cir- the road's so wide, it gives everyone a chance to think that they can move up? Yeah, I think here there's not really one team that can take it up. Um, you know, a lot of teams have fast guys, but. No one's really got a full, like, six, seven guys that can go. You know, they've all got, like, two or three strong men, so it kind of, everyone has a chance and everyone can swamp, and there's <laughs> just bodies everywhere. This is a real ruler's race this week without a time trial. Um, a time trial would probably give you an edge in, a, in the pursuit for a podium place, but you're still right there in the mix. Was today a case of just not losing anything, not getting caught behind a split? Because not really a, a day when you could get up there and get in the top three for a time bonus yeah the first three days was all about that just not losing time being in front of the splits and maybe trying to get a second in one of the sprints if I could which I managed to the first day um, so it's been good so far I think uh, it's all down to the legs on the uh, the climb now tomorrow so tomorrow is Belleville isn't it and then the, the next day is uh, Fayence I think is, there, is it the, the one at Fayence that you're looking at most closely yeah, stage six into Fayence is uh, a GC day for sure. You know, it's a it's a tough climb. I know the climb. It's uh, it's at the end of 100. I mean, 220k as well. So for sure, there'll be gaps there. That'll be the the biggest day I think for for GC. But I think tomorrow's going to be pretty decisive as well. I think everyone's going to test their legs. I'm sure Nibali, Rui Costa, those type of guys are going to go. Um, so yeah, hopefully I. I'll have similar, similar legs to uh, Ruta when I felt like I was climbing good. So if I have the same as that, then I think I'll be there or thereabouts. So I guess we'll soon see. The Humans Invent Cycling Podcast. For more articles, go to humansinvent.com slash cycling. So that was Geraint Thomas there. And he said in that little interview that he anticipated stage four to Belleville being the first important battleground of the race and he was absolutely right. Um, Tom Yelta Slachter who won the Tour Down Under last year uh, when Geraint Thomas was third overall, uh, he was talking in the press conference about starting his season this year a little bit later and specifically targeting um, the Paris-Nice. I saw on Twitter earlier that Jonathan Vaught has made a comment saying uh, Slagter and Thomas are not bad for B riders, you know, riders of the next level down, because uh, obviously last year's winner and runner up, Richie Port and Andrew Telansky, are not here. So we're seeing new names come forward in uh, stage races all the time. 
with this parkour for sure. I heard that uh, uh, someone thought that also John Tegelkop could uh, uh, could do a kind of thinking of the about the general classification. Maybe it's too much, but for sure there will be uh, some new guys. But also an old guy in a certain way. Yes, for example, the world champion Rui Costa. Why not? He seems to be in good shape, and so he could be one of the possible winners of the overall. What did Nibali do today? Was he anywhere to be seen in the finish? Yeah, I mean, I, I spoke, to, as usual, uh, with him after the race. Uh, uh, he told me that his sensation on the climb were good but not excellent. And so he passed with five seconds behind on the, on the last climb. In the tra- he used the descent to stay with the main bunch. He tried at the end to earn some seconds, but... It was not possible. I mean, uh, for him, uh, this race uh, is necessary to build up condition, not more. You didn't try to get into the bus with him or, you know, you try to go to the hotel with him or you're just keeping a safe distance for now? This second choice for me, for the moment, uh, is the best Lionel because, uh, as I already told you, we have to arrive safely at the Tour de France. This is our main goal, and so it's important also in these races to keep distance, you know. What did you think of the race today? It was quite an exciting um, climb on the Mont Bruy, the, the final climb. It was steeper and a lot narrower than I think people were expecting. And then the descent and the finish was almost like a... a a tour of Flanders on a, on a sunny day. Every day in this Paris Nice from now to the finish in Nice will be as a classic. I mean, this is the meaning of this race and in my opinion it's not bad. So who is your tip to win? My tip uh, is Rui Costa. Rui Costa, the world champion to win Paris Nice. You heard it here first from Ciro Scognamilio of Gazette Dello Sport. But uh, it's in necessary, it's too important uh, to say to our uh, followers, to our listeners, I'm uh, maybe my tip on uh, bike races are not so good as my tips as beaches or crepes. I mean, so I mean. Well, you can take uh, you can take whatever you want from that. You know, Chiro, I think is just trying to trying to back out of saying anything that he could be held to account for. I think earlier on this week, I also spoke to Steve Cummings, who won the Tour of the Mediterranean in uh, the south of France last month. Um, he set up that victory with a time trial in uh, the, the second last day, I think it was, and then he still had the job to do on the Mont Ferrand, which is a uh, an almost iconic climb um, on the south coast of France, near to Toulon. Um, so I asked him about that and whether he felt that the absence of a time trial in Paris Nice has altered the complexion of the race for the better or for the worse. Steve, you've had a fantastic start to the season, um, second in Dubai and then winning the Tour of the Med. What's been different for you this spring? Just I haven't been sick or that the programme's been the same. I had a good winter, didn't get injured and consistency really that's, that's about it and then maybe the races suited me more with uh, time trials and stuff like before maybe I did races that didn't have those time trials and stuff so the tour of the med of course a uh, very famous race and you set up victory by winning the time trial but then you still had to uh, finish the job on Mont Ferron which is kind of one of the iconic climbs of uh, the south of France a lot of history on there what, what was it like climbing up there knowing you were in contention for the GC so it's iconic and um, it used to be before maybe 10 years ago like a real test for like all the spring cl- classics riders would go there and test themselves against each other I mean, it was great I'd done the climb once before in Tour of Med and I think I can't remember I was top 10 or something can you describe the character of the climb because it's, it's quite steep in places isn't it and it's got the switchbacks and not yeah. that you were looking but the views off to the right when you're overlooking the sea are fantastic quite a fast downhill and there's a lot of traffic islands so you need to be well placed and it's quite narrow and steep at the bottom and then it flattens off and the road gets smaller and kind of smaller and it's bumpy surface and um, I don't know it's maybe eight nine percent average it's, it's a nice climb I was talking to Max Chiandri, one of your sports directors, a few minutes ago, and he said that a race like Paris-Nice would probably suit you perfectly if they had a time trial in it. So are you slightly disappointed that there's no time trial this week? Yeah, I guess I am really, um, but I knew that before. Um, yeah, it would have been good to have a time trial and have a chance to go for a stage or something, but... Um, there isn't so we have to take other opportunities and try and help the team 
And what is uh, what's in your race programme over the spring and leading into the summer? Uh, is the Tour de France on the agenda? I hope to be selected for the Tour, and then before that, after this, I have um, Waragam, Circuit de la Sarthe, Flesheville on Liège, and then hopefully a little break, and the Tour of Belgium, Switzerland, and then hopefully the Tour. Obviously, the Tour starting in Yorkshire, that, does that add a lot for, for you, starting the race on home soil? It's going to be like, a, a, I guess, a bit of a celebration for British cycling and stuff, so it'd be great to be there, yeah, part of that. The Humans Invent Cycling Podcast. Interviews and analysis. We've got the big talking points covered. So that was Steve Cummings there. The Paris Nice is halfway, halfway over or halfway still to go. It depends whether you're a glass half full or a glass half empty type of person. Um, I said earlier in the show that we have a bit more to hear from Dave Brailsford. And uh, after we talked about the minor controversy of Richie Port leaving Paris-Nice before it had started in order to lead the Sky team at Tirreno Adriatico. I also asked him about the fallout from the World Track Championships where Dave Brailsford was in the news a little bit because of the, particularly the men's side of the team underperforming, uh, certainly compared to um, recent years. So this is what he had to say about the track worlds. Just looking back a week or so to the Track World Championships, um, you attracted a little bit more criticism for not being there this year than you did last year when you didn't, you didn't go to Minsk uh, for much the same reason, I imagine. Um, what was your thought process in, in leaving the um, track squad uh, to Shane Sutton and the, the rest of the coaching squad and how have you reacted to the reaction to that? Um, yeah, I think Shane Sutton's the most experienced track coach in the world I'd say and the best um, he he's more than capable of uh, you know if, if, if you're going to take anybody and say could you go off and run a, a, a track competition please you know his chain would be top of the list for me and for most other people I think um, and um, you know he doesn't lose his enthusiasm he's watching when he watches a track race or track rider or an event on a track He's watching in colour when everybody else is watching black and white. What he's seeing and he tells you about is it's incredible. And his perception of it, he, he knows how the riders are feeling. He's just he's made for that job. He's, he's brilliant in that environment. Um, and then we've got a very good backup team with the coaches, very experienced coaches. We've got you know Keith Reynolds who, who organises it all. It's, it's a super you know, well-drilled well setup. And actually I think it's true that when, um, when we do go to big competitions, the job's done by the time we get there. Um, and, and it, you know, I think I think people can draw draw opinion of whether you know I should have been there or not. But the fact of the matter is that, that we'd already agreed it. We knew how that was going to operate, um, and so I don't think we should mix that too much up with uh, with results. And what I what I see from the worlds um, is a young team who, all bar the men's team pursuit which I think everybody recognised was, was a disappointing result I think that that team I see is a team on the way up so I'm not sure what everybody else is watching really I'm not sure what, what everybody's getting excited about you lose Chris Hoy you lose Vicky Pendleton that's a massive blow to any team so when you look at the men's team sprint who are you know equal with uh, 500 they're equal the best in the world you know young Philip Hines again put the fastest lap in the world in, uh, in the whole competition in you know Jason was Jason then is man two and then we, we're trying to develop a young guy into man three and, we, and we're making progress and anybody can see who looked at him breaks it down into the numbers can see that we're making progress and in two years time the two years between now and Rio if we keep persevering hopefully the trajectory is good enough a bit like it was with Philip a bit like it was with Jason the previous time around in Beijing that actually you think actually we, we stick to that trajectory we could be there or thereabouts and I think that goes with um, for, for quite a few of the events the, the women's team pursuits it's a different event Four kilometres is not three kilometres. Four women is not three women. You know, it's a different event. So people think, oh, we've got this fantastic record in this event we'll call Team Pursuit. But the actual event itself has changed. And when you look at the age of, um, you know, some of the some of the young young girls who are riding in that Team Pursuit now, they're, they're, they're relatively inexperienced. They're performing at a phenomenal level. And it's very, very exciting stuff. So I don't have the, you know, I can see why people are getting a bit flustered maybe about, uh, you know, when you just look at it on paper. But when you look underneath at performance, is there cause for concern? Uh, in my opinion, no. Is there, is there some work to be done? Of course there is. Halfway through an Olympic cycle, it's always a moment to switch on. 
What about your own involvement? Because you've, you've hinted in the press a little bit that you're looking at the, the medium term a bit. Chris Boardman made his comments about um, the team needing its figurehead perhaps there, which, which, uh, which may or may not be the case. Um, but have you thought any more about where your future lies? Well, I, th- I think the, the comments are made, and I think this is where it might have been misconstrued a little bit. The comment I made was that post worlds will sit down and review everything, which is what we do traditionally. And it's, it's you know, it sounds bloody boring. I'll give you that, but it's the way we work, you know. And, and so what we'll do now is we sit down, and we, we regroup, we give it a little bit of time, so the emotion of the results and the emotion of the travel and all the rest of it kind of die down a little bit. You get the numbers out. You analyse. Let's have a proper look at what happened. Let's have a look. Look what we can learn. Could we do anything differently? Is the structure that we've got, is it optimal? Can it work? Is this the best way of doing it? Do we need to change anything? And you go through everything else, you know, so we'll look at what we'll, what, we'll, what we'll stop doing, what we'll start doing, and what we'll continue to do. And I'm as much a part of that mix as any, anything else, and I think if I wasn't, there'd be a problem. Um, so my point was actually, as always, we'll sit down and review where we go, and that's what we'll do. OK, just lastly, you've also been in the news a little bit um, because you're going to get involved with the England team. Um, can you give a little bit of insight into what your role is going to be, presumably not picking the starting eleven or taking coaching sessions? And with Steve Peters offering his assistance as well, should I put a cheeky fiver on England for the World Cup? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, not, not if uh, I'm involved, that was for sure. I don't know a lot about football. Uh, no, but it, it, in all seriousness, I think um, what's happened is, is pretty straightforward. You know, there's quite a lot of um, uh, the guys involved in sports in Britain. A lot of us get together and we share ideas and we talk and, and, and it's just part of the job, you know, and that's, we see what we can take from rugby or, we, you know, Matt Parker's in rugby now and the two other the performance analysts are both in rugby and, you know, we know guys in a Formula One world, we know the football lads and we, and we know each other and they come and see us and see what we're doing. And as part of that dialogue, you know, you say, well, actually, why could you maybe come and see... Like, let's think about tournaments. We do a lot of tournament um, events, and so we've got to go and spend, you know, six weeks away in the boredom, and you're tapering, so you've got more hand, time on your hands than before. You're less fatigued, and people want to do stuff, and all of the little things that you do there could be relevant to somebody else who doesn't necessarily do tournament kind of uh, performances all the time. And it's it's the nuances of that, really. So you know, I, I know Roy, and um, and he, he said, you know, would, would you come over and just maybe have a chat to the lads before going? And not in terms of anything to, you know, I'm I'm, I'm not a, I'm not going to make a case for four four two or or the Christmas tree formation or whatever else it was. Uh, it's not my not my area at all. But what I do know is 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 how to how we've gone about trying to get you know 20 or 30 athletes to perform at the best of their ability over a six or seven week period where a you know daily event um, and there's a bit of a knack to that you know and so we will, we'll share some of that and they can take it if they want they can leave if they want but from Steve's point of view I've been a strong advocate of um, Steve for a long time you know and obviously brought him into sport from um, from the world of psychiatry and medicine and uh, he's been uh, he's been a great asset to us because he's such um, he gives you such a, an insight into how you operate yourself uh, which is most important and then you can start figuring out how you are operating in uh, stressful situations how you operate as a team member how the team impacts on you and all the uh, all these other things you know and I think very simple things when a lot, of, a lot of athletes will think about, and a lot of people will think about the consequences of, of, of an event before it happens. So they start worrying about, well, what happens if I win? What happens if I lose? What am I going to look like? What's, you know, God, I'm getting worried about this now. But actually thinking about the consequence of it is a futile exercise. What you want to think about is how, how am I going to be the best on a day? And he's, he's, he is just so brilliant at all of that stuff. And I think um, he's, he's worked with uh, Stephen Gerrard for quite some time. And obviously now he's working with, with Liverpool. And he's worked with various people, and um, and I think it just makes absolute sense. The question isn't why he's doing it now; is it? the question is why hasn't it been done before? In my opinion, because I think all of the sports have, you know, all modern sports have have, have a big backup team of, of psychologists, psychiatrists, and it's about time that football followed suit, which they are doing. To be fair, so hats off to Roy Hodgson and his team for doing it. I think it's uh, it's a great move. Okay, well, Chiro Scon Emilio of Gazeta della Sport has been a more than able stand-in for Richard and Daniel today. You you are like. Gaudain Thomas to their Richie Port. Thank you very much, Chiro. All that remains is for you to say farewell to your army of fans, your growing army of fans who listen to the podcast. Yes, uh, and Matt, my question is when next podcast with me? Who knows when, Lionel? 
You are the boss, when? Well, which of the... Uh, that's very nice of you to say I'm the boss. I think Richard would probably disagree <laughs> with that. <laughs> <laughs> now you are the boss in Paris because maybe Richard is going holidays. This is the truth. Uh, Richard is going on a very long holiday shortly, but uh, will you be at any of the classics? Will you do all of the, the spring classics? The first part, Flanders and Roubaix. Okay, well, maybe we'll see you there. Why not? Uh, see you soon. Thank you, Chiro. You're listening to the Humans Invent Cycling Podcast. Powered by Sharp.